All right, current hot topic as of late is the backing up of shipping from ships and Ch or, uh, ships coming from China. Um, read an article from the Business Insider here. 56 container ships are stuck outside California ports, worsening shipping delays and costs. These are just the bullet points at the top. I'll put this below. You guys can read it, check it out yourself. And now we're going to cover a bunch of other economic welfare things and the cost of tariffs and um, just things and reasons why we're in the situation that we're in. It is the fourth time in three weeks that Los Angeles and Long Beach ports have hit a new record. The ports account for about one third of U.S. imports serving as a main source of trade with China. Um, We'll get to a little bit more information on that. Um, continuing on in the article, key ports in Southern California have hit a fourth record in less than three weeks as shipping delays surged past early pandemic levels. On Monday, 56 cargo ships were stuck at anchor or in drift areas off of Los Angeles and Long Beach ports. The ports are currently dealing with 140 total ships in the ports, including 87 freighters, according to the Marine Exchange of Southern California. In late August, the ports hit an all-time high not seen since February when the onset of the pandemic and panic buying wreaked havoc on global supply chains. The queue is a result of the COVID-19 related disruptions and holiday buying surges paired with a national labor shortage. Port of Los Angeles data indicates that ships average wait times have increased to 8.5 days. Um, quote, the normal number of container ships at anchor is between zero and one. Kip Lutit, hopefully I said that right. <laughs> the executive director of Marine Exchange of Southern California told Insider in July. Um, I'm just going to riff on this. Um, when you pay people not to work, they're not going to work. And when people are not allowed to leave their house because you told them that COVID is going to rain from the sky and kill them and you're going to spread it to grandma and kill goldfish, babies, and trees, um, people will not work when you institute basically a 15 or 16 dollar an hour minimum wage by that of government forcing people not to work and paying them enhanced unemployment benefits which did start under trump and biden had continued um then once again people just will not work um if you have to choose between a 16 dollar an hour job where you have a lot of leisure time i.e. sitting at home getting paid unemployment, enhanced unemployment benefits, and there's an eviction moratorium where you cannot be thrown out of your house, or you have to get up, get ready, go to work, get prepared, drive, sit in traffic, deal with assholes all day for just $18 an hour, you're gonna look at that $2 an hour difference and decide that your leisure time is more important to you than, uh, than you know, going to work and earning that paycheck. You know, you'll just take the unemployment benefits and I can't blame people necessarily. I don't think it's the right thing, but um, what I think is the right thing is clearly relevant. Um, you know, it's the incentives in place that make people not work. So when people are handed all this money, what do they do with it? They go on a shopping spree. So, and you know, you flip up every last little thing that you get, you know, strings, electronics, you name it. What does it say on it? Made in China. And um, going further into this, um, U.S. trade deficit hits a record, um, reading from Treasury and Risk. The U.S. trade deficit widened to a record in August, reflecting a pickup in the value of imports of consumer goods and industrial supplies. Um, we don't have a strong industrial base anymore. You know, just drive around your local town. When you look at all the factories, they're all closed down. All the windows are busted out of them and they're all closed down because we have moved to more of a service sector economy where we supply services to a lot of the world, which isn't necessarily bad, but you have nothing underlying the strength of your economy, i.e. you have trade deficits and you have no surpluses, um, that's not a very strong foundation for an economy. The gap in trade of goods and services increased 4.2% to 73.3 billion from a revised 73.3 billion in, 70 .3 billion in July, according to Commerce Department data released Tuesday. Um, this is actually dated October 6, 2021. The value of goods and services imports rose 1.4% to a record $287 billion in August. The U.S. imported $3 billion more in consumer goods that month, mostly due to pharmaceuticals and toys, games, and sporting goods. Exports climbed a half a percent to $213.7 billion. So right there, that tells you that we are importing way more than we're exporting. Um, 
the reason why this trade deficit is so great because all Americans have to do is print dollars. You know, how much effort does it take to run a printing press to print paper and then hand it to the rest of the world, which really we're not even running a printing press, you know, there's just digits on a computer. Um, Jerome Powell and uh, Janet Yellen just, you know, <laughs> money printer go burr, as uh, a lot of the meme lords would like to say. Um, we print all this money and just, you know, hand it off to the citizens and what do the citizens do. We go out and spend ass loads of money offshore and import a whole bunch of stuff, which runs up our trade deficit. And we're not producing anything because our um, labor force participation rate is so low. Um, I'll put this article as well from Treasury and Risk in the description below. But um, you look at our labor force participation rate in a grid, you know, from one year. Um, last year, October 2020, we were at 61.6% workforce participation rate. Um, we're at about the same now. Um, you know, at, at the highest, it went to 61.7 <laughs> in the last year, which is horrible. That means almost 40% of the workforce that can work is not working. If we go to a five-year chart, at the highest, it was at 63.5%. Um, you expand it out to a 10-year, this graph just continually goes down. And granted, there's some up points and there's some down points, but um, the trajectory is consistently down. At the highest, we were at you know, about 64.5% of workforce participation rate all the way back in 2012. So 10 years ago, we still had a relatively weak workforce. There weren't a lot of people working. Trump called this out as a candidate, and he was spot on that uh, the unemployment numbers are complete and total f farce. They're not right at all. Um, you know, they're not 40% on the dot, because I'm sure there's nuances within there. But um, to say that there's only 5% unemployment, but you have a 64.5% workforce participation rate, clearly there's a very, very, very large disparity there that's not being addressed because it's not beneficial to this mainstream narrative to say that the American economy is a house of cards. Um, I will put the PDF, this is from Trading Economics. Um, I'll put this below, and it's actually really interesting to look at this graph. You could. Uh, go one year, five year, 10 year, 25 year to the entire history. Um, I think it's very, very interesting. Um, just some quick hits on welfare. Um, this is from fortunately.com. An estimated 59 million Americans receive welfare during an average month. Um, that's from the Urban Institute. 24 million children use welfare every month. At least 13 million people live in poverty and don't receive any bill benefits from welfare programs. Um, the cost of welfare programs, and this is reading from lexingtonlaw.com, the total cost of poverty assistance programs in America can add up to a shocking $1 trillion a year when combining both federal and state level program budgets. Because of the large total price tag on helping the poor, welfare programs are often an area of policy of budgetary debate. Um, I would make the argument that you're not helping the poor. People feel good when they go to work. Your work gives you purpose, getting up in the morning, and striving to make more money is what makes you feel better generally. Now, maybe not everybody, but by and large, a lot of people who go to work every day feel good about their work and they do their work because it gives them purpose and it allows them to bear the burden of responsibility of taking care of themselves, their family, and those who they are responsible for, which unfortunately now at this current position, a lot of taxpayers are responsible for a large amount of people who are unproductive. Um, in 2020, a total of $9.88 trillion was spent on welfare programs in America. The source is U.S. government spending. In 2021, $8.3 trillion is projected to be spent on welfare programs in America. Once again, the source is the U.S. government spending. Um, third bullet point, $4.83 trillion of that total is budgeted for federal spending specifically in 2021. So, I mean, the welfare spending is off the charts. That's a ridiculous amount of money. Our national debt is almost $30 trillion. We're at about $28 trillion. Um, I should have pulled up the national debt clock, but everybody can just Google that, and you'll see it's mind-boggling how fast that goes up. I believe the average debt per taxpayer was that of around $230,000, um, $230, which I don't know about you, but <laughs> I wish I made that much. I don't make anywhere near that much. $230,000 is a fair shake of money. The 1% in the United States um, starts at around, I believe it's like $300,000. So um, the average debt per taxpayer is around the income of that, of the 1% that you hear so much about. And um, 
you can look this up as well. I'll try and find the article, but um, a majority of taxes are paid by people who make over 80 grand a year and the 1% pays about 40% of that 80%. So you would have to drastically increase taxes on the middle class to pay for a lot of this stuff that um, we're being told needs paid for. Um, now hitting on the cost of tariffs. Um, the economic cost of tariffs from the AmericanActionForum.org. This analysis focuses exclusively on the impacts of tariffs unilaterally imposed by former President Trump is still in effect under President Biden. Um, clearly, Biden has no interest in taking off these tariffs. These include tariffs either enacted or officially ordered under Section 232 or S Section 301. Section 232 allows the president to impose trade barriers if the Department of Commerce finds that imports threaten U.S. national security. Section 301 enables the president to impose tariffs or quotas when the United States Trade Representative, USTR, finds that other nations are engaging in unfair trade practices. Um, let me just rant on this for one second. The whole world is engaging in what you could call unfair trade practices. Um, China is worse than us, actually. Their GDP to debt, they're they're you know spending 250% of their GDP. So the amount of money that they take in, they're spending over double what they take in. That's I mean that's like the definition of a Ponzi scheme. And it's the same deal with the U.S. We're at I think it's 130% of debt to GDP. So we're spending way 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 more we take in in taxes and our interest rates are ridiculously low. People are not encouraged to save. We can borrow money at next to zero cost. So if it doesn't cost you anything to borrow money, then you know who cares? Let the good times roll. You know, spend some money. Rain free money on the people. Interest rates are 0%. You can borrow, you can afford it. But the problem is eventually interest rates have to go up to encourage people to save and that's going to expose a lot of malinvestment in the economy um when interest rates are low you can invest in things that you wouldn't invest in otherwise they may not be feasible in a high interest rate environment but because we've had we have this large bubble economy and um interest rates are low and people can do whatever they want for basically no consequences and you're not worried about saving because inflation is eroding away the value of your dollars um you know, who cares? Spend money. Um, continuing on, the table below lists the approximate values of imports that are currently facing new tariffs under President Donald Trump and now President Joe Biden. Excuse me. It additionally displays the estimates of how the tariffs could increase nationwide consumer costs, assuming that 100% of the costs of the tariffs will be passed on to consumers that current import levels will not change. While this estimate is upper bound, it represents an upward pressure that is placed on all prices in the economy. Um, next paragraph, although the tariffs could increase nationwide consumer costs by $51 billion annually altogether, the tariffs could increase nationwide consumer costs by $51 billion annually, sorry. Previously, after former President Donald Trump had already imposed the first three rounds of tariffs, approximately $250 billion of U.S. imports from China, the president ordered new 10% tariffs to be imposed on the remainder of imports from China. Upon China announcing its intention to retaliate, the former president increased these new tariffs from 10% to 15%. The 15% levy was planned in two waves. Tariffs on list 4A went into effect September 1st, 2019, and tariffs on list 4B were planned to go into effect December 15th, 2019. China's retaliation also spurred former President Trump to order an increase on third tranche of tariffs, 25% tariffs already in effect on roughly $200 billion of imports to 30%. Um, anybody who really understands stuff about economics or can look up a simple definition, what is a tariff? A tariff is a tax on imported goods. And these tariffs actually tend to hit people who import more goods, actually the lower end of the economic spectrum, people who don't earn as much have to buy these cheaper goods. I do like the idea of buying things in America, but unfortunately that's not quite feasible for a lot of people because the price to make things in America is a lot higher due to government. This is not a Trump thing. This is just years and years of government overreach and regulation that drives up the cost of goods. If you drive up the cost of goods, then you know people are going to respond to that incentive and buy the cheaper goods, which just happen to be made in China. China's once again a large Ponzi scheme, a lot like the U.S. is. We're spent, you know, they just like us spend more money than we take in, and just run up these huge debts. 
Um, reading from an article in the Global Times, the facts already show that tariffs have harmed American companies and consumers. U.S. importers absorb 92.4% of additional costs resulting from the elevated tariffs imposed on Chinese goods, according to a report by Moody's Investor Service. Oxford Economics estimated the cost of the trade war to be around half a percent of U.S. GDP during 2018 to 19, equivalent to $108 billion, which also cost the U.S. 245,000 jobs and $88 billion in real household income. Tariffs have pushed up prices and exacerbated U.S. inflation levels. Um, once again, if you have to run up a huge trade deficit and you're handing all, all this money to people who are not productive and you're going to punish people who import goods, then you're going to drive up inflation. I mean, that's just the way it is. Less people are going to work, less people are going to produce things, more people are going to buy things offshore, which thus makes American people poorer, and it's just not good. So, you know, kind of this long tangent goes back to this whole deal with the 56 cargo ships, uh, you know, sitting off the port of California. When we have these large trade deficits, when we owe the world, you know, billions of dollars and we're importing so much and, you know, you're going on Amazon, you're buying stuff off eBay, you're buying everything offline and everything is made in China because it's cheaper to produce things there because they have a little bit more of a free economy, regardless, still a house of cards. Um, they produce things and we consume those things that they produce and we send them dollars, then, you know, you're going to have all these ships trying to get goods in and that's eventually going to bottleneck because you have all these dollars being spent on goods that we're not producing here. So what's the solution? To get all these ships out of here, we need to start becoming a freer nation. We need to roll back the state, roll back government, roll back regulations and make our economy you know, the self it once was. We are no longer the America that we were back in the, you know, 1900s, you know, from the, you know, early 1900s to the 50s and even to the 80s when we had large trade surpluses. That has all gone away. Our industrial base is gone. We have strip malls, we have hotels, we have, you know, all these high rises, which are all services and, we don't have an industrial base. We don't produce anymore. We get everything from other countries. So in order for us to become a, you know, real viable economy again, we would have to start producing, which is going to cause a lot of short term pain because a lot of people are going to have to go back to school. A lot of people are going to have to get factory jobs. They're going to have to work longer hours potentially. And we're going to have to produce things in order con to consume. Um, that's kind of one of the basic laws of economics in order to consume you must or in order to consume you must produce yeah um, right now like I said because we have these large trade deficits it doesn't look good for our economy and it's going to drive up inflation so the answer is less government <laughs> shocker everything that the government touches it turns to crap essentially when you give people the incentive to not work and pound people with taxes and regulations and lawsuits and all these reasons for them not to work they are not going to work they're going to send their businesses offshore where there's not where they're not punished as much i mean that's essentially what you're doing is punishing people for being productive working and making things and then you know if these people who are working for you producing these things don't like their conditions the government has made it so you sue the employer you don't sue the person that's harassing you you sue the employer so why would you hire anybody go send your stuff offshores you know have the hell with it send your stuff offshores they're not going to sue you at least they they're not as likely as people are here in america because that's a honeypot it's an endless honeypot um, you know, the government has made it so that it's so, you know, it, it's essentially rigged against um, business owners, eviction moratoriums, and then <clears throat> being taxed and regulated. Um, there's just no reason to open up businesses in America anymore when you can go do it offshores. And I'm not saying that people shouldn't try and people shouldn't open up businesses in America, but the cards are stacked against you. So I don't blame people for going offshores. So, you know, my whole point here is get rid of the government, get government almost entirely out of business, if not entirely out of business, then we'll see our economy reduce or um, 
you know, become a real viable, strong economy. We'll produce things and we'll be able to consume and we'll have trade surpluses. Inflation will get driven down and then we'll be able to raise interest rates because we'll be able to afford it. Right now we can't afford um, a rise in interest rates. Um, but that is what needs to happen. We need to become a productive economy. Interest rates need to rise so that way people can save to invest in capital to become more productive. And then we can export things and create trade surpluses and become the America that we once were. Um, that's all. Let me know what you guys think. Thanks for checking it out. Like, subscribe, share, and uh, till next time.